good morning. Uh, I'm very happy and honored that I can now uh, warmly welcome and introduce our next speaker, who is uh, Professor Hans Roy Gumbleit. Uh, we have agreed that I should just make a short introduction. That's a bit of a problem with someone like uh, Zen, uh, precisely him, because he's this uh, extremely uh, productive uh, scholar and intellectual, but I'll do it uh, as short as possible. Zen is the Albert Guerin uh, Professor of Literature at Stanford University. At the same time, he's associated with uh, several other universities and research institutions, such as uh, Collège de France in Paris, where he's an, uh, a professor attaché, and uh, the German pilot university, uh, Tetley University. Uh, he has received numerous honorary, honorary doctorates, for example, from the University of Aarhus here in Denmark and several others. The publications, well, it's an enormously long list, hundreds of articles. Uh, uh, he has edited many books and written a lot of uh, uh, monographies. Among those, to name some of them, in 1926, Living at the Edge of Time, from 1997, The Powers of Theology, from 2003, Production of Presence, 2005, Embrace of Athletic Beauty, 2006, Stimmungen Lesen, 2011, Presence, 2012, and after 1945, Latency as Origin of the Present, 2013, and I'm sure that there are much more on its way. In the everyday, one can read such uh, contributions to, uh, uh, for example, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung and Neue Zürcher Zeitung, which uh, one should know are probably, I would say, uh, the two best newspapers in the world. Uh, now, Zen is back in Denmark, meaning that you have been here several times before, uh, so it's good to have you back again. Uh, actually, you were, this, this is a, a, a lecture of excellence, as it's called here at SDU, uh, and you were actually the first uh, speaker at all in this series uh, in 2006, where we were speaking about uh, uh, Today, the subject is uh, the concept of presence, and it's very self-evident that you would be invited to this conference since you wrote a half-breaking uh, book on presence in 2004. Presence, uh, what meaning cannot uh, convey uh, this very volume. I bought it in 2005 when I was in Stanford for the first time, Stanford University Bookstore, $18. Uh, and for me, this was a, a kind of an intellectual revelation, I have to say. And therefore, I'm looking very much forward, together with the rest of the audience, I'm sure, to your lecture today on presence as a condition of aesthetic experience with some historical speculations also. Thank you. Welcome. That uh, would be very, very difficult to get back to natural light. I mean, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm, I'm not much of an ecologist, but okay. despite living in Silicon Valley, I'm completely hopeless with any kind of technology. So I have no PowerPoint. I know that without having PowerPoint, you have no authority today, but... <laughs> but so, so it's maybe in exchange for PowerPoint to take old age. I was already announced as a professor and emeritus today. It's only going to happen next year, but yes, as a forthcoming emeritus, I claim this exchange. Uh, maybe you take my pre emeritus uh, dignity instead of PowerPoint. And some, some natural light, I mean, if, you, if you're into ecology, maybe you think that's the same. Anyway, um, you know, this was so kind to have this very, very nice introduction by my, my friend Ernest. Um, uh, a colleague of mine at Stanford, a much admired colleague, Kate White, once said, uh, 
I had about one good idea in my life, but hey, most people have none, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's been my case with the presence. I mean, you get always invited in your old age to talk about the presence. I mean, and I even, had not even remembered that at this university, at this Augusta University, I inaugurated the lecture series talking about Shimon, which is the derivative of presence. I didn't even remember that so often have I talked about presence. So in order not to bore myself, because I think if I'm bored by what I'm saying, you will get bored. That's contagious. There's no way out of that. I tried to do something new. I tried to do, I tried to find an angle in which to combine uh, in a new way presence, uh, aesthetic experience, uh, the history of the historical worldview, the history of the historical worldview, maybe also indirect, I'm not going to talk about it explicitly. Uh, what the humanities might be able, humanities and arts might be able to do today, and this new angle that I've never tried out really uh, has to do with the concept that we all use when we talk about aesthetic experience, when we talk about presence. Tice, for example, and I love the way he described his gaze, where you think it's, I mean, it didn't count, but maybe about 10 times, I'm not criticizing that, and that's intense, intensity. Intensity. So intensity is going to be my main angle. I'm not going to talk all that much about it, but the vanishing point from which I, or under which I will try to bring together presence, aesthetic experience, and let's say historicity will be uh, intensity. And I've never done that. So at least as I've never done that, I'm trying it out, and I want to give myself to you and give my point of view to you. I'm not bored uh, by what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> so let me remind myself, you know, pre alzheimer uh, uh, of what I normally mean when I'm saying presence. I mean, basically, coming from everyday experience, I mean tangibility. Yeah? I mean tangibility, I mean like in the sense that the title was invoked from like pre essay pre essay originally, I mean originally, but etymologically is not temporal but spatial. Yeah? Something that's in front of you, pre essay so you can touch it, tangibility. And unfortunately, for example, my wife over in California is not tangible for me at this moment. I mean, if I say she's present to me, she's present in a different way. Um, you could have laughed at the joke, so it was late. <laughs> <laughs> secondly, secondly, that means uh, that we invoke ourselves when we talk about present in a way that's non Cartesian, non Cartesian in the way I think, therefore I am. If you say I think, therefore I am, you make synonymous the ontology of human existence and your consciousness. Right? When you say it's about tangibility, you need a body to be involved. Is that clear? And once you have a body involved, as you could say phenomenologically, I mean, Weidenfels, who has been invoked here, who explained that much better than I do, once you talk about human existence, including uh, our somatic, our physical, uh, existence, then you have space, because space is precisely that dimension that evolves around the presence of the body. And that's all kind of presence 101 or less than 101. Um, the main point, however, uh, and the main point of that book, Production of Presence, is really that within Western culture, I would say, starting with early modernity, uh, this dimension has been bracketed, has been eliminated, at least by intellectuals. Yeah? I mean, this is, for example, why we have such a highly differentiated terminology, so many good distinctions in the tradition of Western philosophy about temporality. And when we want to talk about space, there are not so many distinctions, not so many concepts available. That's a salient point. I mean, that's, I think, why uh, presence can be fascinating intellectually. It has been fascinating not only for me for the past decade or, or 20 years because it's almost a rediscovery. I mean, it's something that we have eliminated. We basically say there are two relations to the world uh, that are inevitably human existence. One is what we can call in an everyday sense interpretation. Uh, we cannot not try to make sense with perception. So I'm perceiving your faces. I'm asking myself whether you are being bored or are passionately interested in what I'm saying, for example. And you are smiling, so I think she likes what I'm saying. I cannot, you cannot switch that off, you know that. Uh, but that's what we're normally focusing upon, especially you know, in the humanities and large social sciences and so forth and so forth. And this other relationship, for example, that you are just more tangible to me than somebody sitting up there and that my, that my wife in California. That is also something we cannot switch off. We constantly do that. We constantly operate that 
but it's normally not seen in us. You get this point. So when we talk presence, it is important to keep in mind that this is tendentially, and this is still true for our everyday, the dimension that we break it. And that's very particular, I say, for modern, postmodern, transhuman, whatever you want to call it, Western culture. Okay, so that's just uh, as a starting point. You don't have to agree on that, but when I will say presence in the future, I mean exactly this, okay? Now, uh, intensity is more exciting for me, and what I'm proposing uh, is neither completely Deleuze, as my American fellow citizens say, I know it's Deleuze. Uh, it's neither fully Deleuze nor fully science, it's a mixture of that. I propose, but I will say intensity uh, in this lecture, I mean a movement, and I mean a movement of contraction from contingents, and things being polyperspectival or things being just juxtaposed without any relationship towards a structure in which those things are pulled together in an assembly that has contours, that has individuality, that has form, that has a singular form. So out of contingency towards something that has a form, something that has a shape, something that has identity, not in the gender identity sense, for example, but identity as a space, uh, as a form, as a pro profile um, that is singular. That's what I understand by um, intensity. I think this process of bringing things together unfolds a certain energy. Yeah? And that's what we mean, for example, when we have this gaze, there's a feeling of intensity because all these elements come together in the singularity, I mean, not singularity in the sense of certain well, in the singularity, uh, in the specificity of this gaze uh, that has this intensity. So things come together, and I think it's precisely this process that gives us this feeling of engagement. Now, if you think intensity, and if you think of a process of bringing contingent things together in a form, then you also think about the end point of that, and we have black holes. Yeah? Black holes, in a way, would be, I mean, as the maximum contraction of substance. As a maximum contraction of substance that's not capable of having a form. Because everything is together in a minimal space, in an almost, I mean, zero plus space, uh, would be the end point of that. So you could say, if you start with this movement of contraction that produces a form, if you go too far, if you go too far of it, uh, you have a black hole situation. You have a situation without form. You have a feeling of what the version that the Lee were referring to when they were saying a body without organs. And the body without organs was actually basically an intuition by black hole. So again, my point, I mean, I want to play with presence in this field between Intensity as a movement, so you have something that's probably perspective, that's just tracks of books, you have nothing to do together, and you bring them together into a form. And if you go too far, you have a black hole, and you may even kind of get into a whirlpool and disappear yourself. Okay? It's very dramatic, but as you all look at me like I've lost it with this definition, uh, I wanted to say something threatening. Okay, this is just uh, what I will mean when I say intensity. And uh, when I say black holes, and when I say presence, and I hope it all becomes clear with the menu of what I want to do today, to the parkour of this lecture goes like this. In the first part, I want to kind of uh, go with you very, very briefly, very, very quickly, like a quick, a quick step. This process within which in Western culture the dimension of presence got lost. Hmm? So this would be a step from the Middle Ages to early modernity, very briefly. Uh, then the first canonization of that in the 17th century, the century of rationality, uh, the century of Descartes, the century of people like Leibniz, etc., etc., the century of mathematics, modern mathematics. And my hypothesis will be that what we call aesthetics, and the word aesthetics as we were using it, did not exist before the 17th century and could not have existed without this elimination of presence from Western culture. Is that clear? Yeah, I will explain that, but that's my main thesis about what we're referring to when we say aesthetics. So I'm, I'm saying that what we call aesthetics is neither meta-historical nor transcultural. It is something that could only come up both as a concept and as a way of referring to the world under specific Western conditions. 
I'm not saying that African cultures or Asian cultures are not capable of doing aesthetics. Don't be that far from me, of course. I mean, it would be horrible and put it to be very incorrect. And I really don't mean it. But I'm just saying, you could also say aesthetics is a specific pathology of Western culture if you need to flagellate yourself. You get my point? So I'm not saying it's a claim of superiority, but it is specific to Western culture. Uh, in the second part, I want to describe this situation, this environment uh, that has led to the emergence of aesthetics in present-day culture. So this is presence in a temporal sense. Now, in present-day culture, so I will describe how something about the predominance of a Cartesian world who was dominant, how aesthetics was profiting from that, etc., etc. So how are these things today, uh, 2017? How can we analyze it today? What is the, if you want, present state uh, of aesthetic experience? Has something changed in relation to the early 18th century when this concept was first used? Is that it? And then finally, uh, three parts, but the third part is very, very brief. I will try to uh, relate that to intensity and uh, to black holes mainly to intensity. Now, as I'm speaking from notes, and I always do that, especially in lectures of excellence, but also in lectures of non-excellence, uh, it's very hard to predict how long this is going to be. I mean, at the beginning, you're all laughing my jokes and stuff, and then I get very loquacious and it takes long. Uh, then you're looking at me like very sternly, then I feel embarrassed and I skip things, it's going to be quick. Now you look neutral and uh, wissenschaftly, scientific, almost like a German audience. <laughs> It's going to last exactly uh, 39 minutes, leaving two minutes for discussion. <laughs> okay. Whatever the length is going to be, the responsibility will be fully yours now. Um, uh, this historical part, and I'm trying to be very brief. Uh, let me make some contrast between medieval culture and early modern culture, because I think that the status of presence in medieval culture was completely different, so that one could say emphatically that is very, very correct. Medieval culture, typologically speaking, was a presence culture in an, in an exemplary way. Um, human self-reference in medieval culture, coming uh, from Genesis, but not only coming from Genesis, was clearly a self-reference that included the body and the spirit. Yeah? Think of Genesis, I mean, first God takes some dirt, some earth, to build Adam, and later on Adam's rib to build Eva. So that is uh, uh, the somatic part. And then there is this respiration of God, this breath of God. I mean, that is the spiritual part. So the self-reference is a double one. Modern self-reference, take the card, is purely spiritual. Is that clear? So the body falls by the wayside in the transition from the Middle Ages to early modern. Hmm? That means, secondly, in relation to the material world, so I'm not talking about world in the philosophical and the Heideggerian sense, material world, natural world, that uh, medieval self-reference uh, implies that humans are inhabiting the world. They are surrounded by the world. They are part of the world. They are part of God's creation on the seventh day, and so forth and so forth. Part of it. I mean, I'm not saying it all comes from the Torah, it all comes from Genesis, but as people who are believing in that, uh, that is a good way of referring to it. Okay? Whereas um, the modern relationship and still our relationship to the world is a subject-object relationship. We consider ourselves being of service, being pure consciousness. We consider ourselves to be outside of service of the world of objects. And there's an ontological gap, because if we consider ourselves consciousnesses, I know that the plural does not exist, that means we are ontologically different from the material, from the world of objects. Is that clear? Thirdly, uh, a modern world observer, us modern, we constantly interpret the world, and by interpreting the world, uh, we produce knowledge. So we think of ourselves as producers of knowledge. Yeah? Everything we're doing, we don't have to be academics, Maybe it's even better not to be academic. We produce knowledge. Whereas there is no production of knowledge in medieval self right? The modality of having knowledge in the Middle Ages is revelation. That God decides how much knowledge he or she wants to give us. It's revelation. You get my point? 
And so, I mean, forcing it, I could go on and on and on. Uh, you could say, in modern culture, we constantly try to use knowledge in order to transform the world. That's what we consider to be history. Yeah, we apply knowledge, and we feel that uh, we have an obligation somehow, an urge, to transform the world based on our knowledge. Yeah? I mean, this is what the humanities always criticize for, that they're not good enough in applying the knowledge that they're producing. Whereas, uh, the revealed knowledge of the Middle Ages was absolutely not mandatory, was not an urge to transform the world. It rather was a knowledge that you could use to find your place in the world to find your place in rituals that you could consider a kind of choreography to participate in the organic non-self transformation. Is that clear? So, okay, I could go on and on and on. The point I want to make is that in the emergence of Western modernity, what we call modernity, this presence element, yeah, the somatic self-reference, the body, uh, this being part of the world, inhabiting the world, this being revelation coming from God is being bracketed. And we can't say uh, that the 17th century is the first century that does not only participate in this historical movement, but that reflects this historical movement. And this is Descartes. I mean, Cogito Egresum, for example, uh, became so successful, had such resonance, it was not an invention by Descartes because it kind of described the state of the art. The state of the art is very, very different uh, from the human culture. But for example, the entire reflection of uh, Leibniz about the monads, uh, mathematics becoming so central, is not a symptom for that. Is that clear? Now, I think only against this backdrop can one understand why in the 1730s, and it was a master thesis, it wasn't a master thesis, so an academic apprenticeship, <coughs> a young German philosopher, Baumgarten, at a university with the area, which in the early 18th century is very, very important, Halle, close to Leipzig, wrote this uh, in Latin, uh, this dissertation about aesthetics. And he was saying, uh, well, there are certain situations in which our experience of the world is not only conceptual. It is also sensual. Yeah? The senses enter there, the body enters there, tangibility. He mentions tangibility enters there. And in order to describe that, uh, he borrows a word from ancient Greek, and that's aesthesis, but aesthesis didn't mean aesthetics, it means perception. So it is an experience of the world, says Baumgarten, that includes perception. But again, my point that this was exceptional for him that this was specific for him, was a new thing that could not have happened in the Middle Ages. You get the point. Right? My claim is that as any experience in medieval culture would include the senses, everything was aesthetic, and that means nothing was aesthetic. Yeah? The specificity, the autonomy of what we call aesthetic since the 18th century had to do with this exceptional status. Is that clear? I mean, that's the first serious hypothesis that I want to contribute to this colloquium. At least I have not published it, to my knowledge. Snoop, he is first president. So, uh, interesting that this nobody in philosophy, Baumgarten, had a huge resonance. I mean, the great philosophical authority uh, together with David Hume, uh, Kant, in the third critique, explicitly refers to this predecessor of his. And says, this is very, very important what he's saying, to take that into account. And in the third critique, uh, the critique of the power of judgment, some people have called it Kant's aesthetic judgment. It's exaggerating a little bit. In the later chapters that normally nobody reads, he actually talks about the possibility of aesthetic experience to find something like a synthesis, like a stimmung, he says, an attunement between sensual experience and conceptual experience. Yeah? And you find similar considerations in Schiller in the letters on aesthetic education. You find that in Hegel's aesthetics, point being uh, that aesthetics as a philosophical subdiscipline is booming around 1800 and during the 19th century. 
But I think it would never have happened without this bracketing of the central, of the present part of our existence that has always been going on, but has not found any attention. Is that clear? OK. So to go back to mainstream modernity, uh, I think we cannot really understand uh, the process of modernity without taking into account that around 1800, during what the really great German historian Reinhard Porzelle called the saddle time, Thomas Schöwald, uh, we can observe the emergence of the historical warfare. Uh, something that we take for granted, uh, something that the previous discussion took for granted, but something that did not exist in 1750, proof being, if uh, you look at the uh, entry classique in Diderot's and Donobert's Encyclopédie, first volume, 1751, uh, classic, uh, instead of describing what classic is, a relation of immediacy to something from the past that should be a relation of otherness, how we would describe it, there's just two lists. Classical are the authors, list of 38 Latin authors and 20 plus Greek authors from Greek antiquity, Latin antiquity, whose writing was so good that we can still use it in the lycée in a high school to teach writing. Get my point? This is a complete absence of what we call historical vision of the world, historical senses. Now, I believe that the so-called historical worldview emerges beginning in the third quarter of the 18th century, when a small group uh, in the society, those people who are called the 18th century philosophers, which meant intellectuals, started to develop a way of not being able to not observe themselves in the observation of the world. So self-observation, second-order observation, became a bit of that you could document for philosophers, for intellectuals in the third quarter of the 18th century. And I believe that this was the origin of the historical world. How can one explain that? Uh, well, if you observe yourself in the act of world observation, you realize that your world observation, your experience, depends on your point of view. Right? And as you know quickly <coughs> that there's always potentially an infinity of points of view, you also realize that each world, I mean, each object has a potential infinity of representations. And that is something that, uh, if you speak my language, drives philosophers philosoph crazy towards 1800. I mean, there's a real horror of Acqui, epistemological horror of Acqui. I mean, the young Heinrich von Kleist, who was not much of a philosopher, but an artillery officer, interestingly, uh, after reading 20 pages of Kant, enters in what uh, Kleist specialists call a Kant crisis. And that was a close to clinical depression, as he wrote to his fiancée Wilhelmine, is when I'm reading Kant, I believe that objects no longer exist. <laughs> yeah, and, and so, okay. Uh, the second problem that comes from this second order observation is somebody who observes herself in the act of world observation realizes that world observation does not only go in the Cartesian way through concepts, but that the body plays a role too. And this is a late 18th century materialism. How does the physical, the perceptual, appropriation of the world relate to the spiritual, the conceptual appropriation of the world experience. That's what you call Nida O, for example, the champion of that uh, late 18th century museum. So there are two problems. Uh, the two problems get solved uh, very quickly, although only retrospectively what I will now describe can be identified as a solution. But the second problem, materialism, gets solved by eliminating. There's not much talking about that during the 19th century. One could actually say, and I would say with more authority, if I know more about the history of science, it only comes back in Einstein's relativity. It doesn't play a role during uh, the 19th century. What I want to focus upon as the origin of the historical worldview is the problem of perspectives. Yeah? I mean, infinity of representations for each object of reference. I think this gets solved by switching from a mirror-like, from a one-to-one -one principle of world representation, 
There's one canonical description for each object of reference. This is the principle of the encyclopedia, which is an invention of the 18th century, to a narrative epistemological principle. From the early 19th century on, if somebody asks what's Denmark, you have a tendency to tell the history of Denmark. And if somebody asks why is a horse in a pre darwinian way, it has a tendency of telling the evolutionary history of the horse. And if somebody is as crazy as Jan Hegel and asks himself, what is the spirit? He ends up writing a book, The Phenomenology of the Spirit, which is a narrative. Okay? Why is a narrative the solution? A narrative is a solution which a narrative pattern allows you to accommodate different perspectives on an object. Get the point? With the claim, then, that this sequence is philosophically necessary, that you can identify regularities in transformations of the world, what people have been calling laws of history. Is that the issue? Is that it? So this is the historical world, and all of a sudden, around 1830, it is so firmly established that people believe time and temporality is this. It is the capacity to work the past through and leave the past behind yourself. It is secondly a future that appears as an open horizon of possibilities that we can shape, that humans can shape. That's how Marx describes history, for example. It is perceiving presence as an imperceptibly short moment of transition. Presence has no substance. This was a quote from Baudelaire, Paul David Baudelaire, 1858. Moment imperceptiblement, imperceptiblement bref de transition. And fourthly, that this present is the epistemological habitat of our Cartesian self-reference of the subject, capital S. That in the present, based on experience from the past, we as subjects, as consciousnesses, choose among the possibilities of the future. And that's what we call agency. That's what we call active, hunter in Germany. And that becomes central for the human self-reference. And it's central today in the capacity of active is what makes us humans. And I'm not saying animals cannot act, I'm not getting into this discussion, I'm just describing this sort of thing. And finally, the historical worldview, of course, also means uh, that time is a necessary agent of change. Uh, things cannot not change in time. Is that clear? Uh, let me mention just in passing, because I have this timepiece, unfortunately, challenging me all the time, not in a modern Felsian way. I would like not to respond to it, but <laughs> uh, that while this historical worldview becomes the main axis of Western thought and very dominant as being recorded by colonialism and unto the present day, I would say, is a basis for better or worse of global communication, uh, there is a different worldview on the periphery that I would associate, and this is the book I'm presently writing, with Ideo, with people like Goya, with uh, this very strange philosopher of nature, Lichtenberg, with Mozart. I mean, great cultural protagonists, but people who are not as much as Hegel or Marx, for example, in the center of what we consider to be our world. In that worldview, uh, A, uh, the soma is never eliminated. So much is never eliminated. In that worldview, uh, contingents, polyperspectivism is never eliminated. So polyperspectivism is never transformed into a necessary sequence. In that worldview, you are not claiming uh, that things happen necessarily. In that worldview, uh, you have to have judgment. So this is a worldview that I'm not saying is identical with aesthetics, with an aesthetic relationship to the world, but this world really has an affinity, is that clear? So precisely because the soma is not eliminated, precisely because every perspective is not eliminated, precisely uh, because judgment, I mean, having a plurality of possibilities and you judge, is not eliminated. So I can say that uh, the 19th century and the early 20th century, the Western world goes like this. What dominates in the everyday is the historical worldview. Yeah? 
The third world is not only for historians, that is also for capitalism, because you need an open future. Uh, without the historical worldview, uh, you can also not imagine socialism. Uh, without the historical worldview, you cannot imagine parliamentary democracy, for example, because you need to believe in the possibility of shaping the future in order to engage with parliamentary democracy. Now, in this 19th century, in which, and unfortunately that's not my idea, but I think it's a brilliant idea, it comes from the great liberty theorist Wolfgang Iser, most people pronounce him Iser, that's Iser, uh, he once said, progressively during the 19th century art began to occupy the traditional place of religion. Yeah? Art becomes uh, transcendental. So the everyday uh, is the historical worldview. And what begins to replace art is aesthetic experience. Yeah? So what Baumgarten had first identified, what was regarded to be exceptional, autonomous. Yeah, one could say as a footnote, but about that I'm going to talk more at Flensburg uh, on Monday, uh, that the humanities and arts who emerged during uh, the 19th century become the quasi-theology of art, literature, etc., etc., as quasi-religion of the 19th and early 20th century. Okay? So this was a lot, this was a lot of time, but given what I tried to cover, it also was a quick study. But you get my point, I mean, where I am. So I think this is still canonical. Yeah? The universities, for example, all over the world, still function under this premise. When we talk about art, when we talk about temporality, et cetera, et cetera. Is that okay? Now, my second point, my second thesis is that while in certain pockets of our Western and global culture, and by global, I'm not claiming universal human culture. I'm proposing to understand by global that culture that is somehow connected to electronic communication, for better or worse. Okay. And if you want, uh, with all kinds of interior uh, self-flagellations or accusations of Silicon Valley, I don't know. Um, anyway, that's what I understand I'm saying global, because it's a, it's a banal question and always comes into discussion. So, that is still the basic assumption, but I think that our everyday has profoundly changed. So don't think about being at the university, think about the early morning brushing your teeth, temporality and time then, or for my case, early morning first cigarette. That cigarette that gives you this fantastic kick into your brain. It hurts a little bit, but you start thinking, well, wow. <laughs> so this is a recommendation for non smokers. <laughs> <laughs> so I think. In those moments when we do not reflect, the future is no longer an open horizon of possibilities to be shaped. The future is a space occupied by threats that come slowly towards us. Global warming, exhaustion of resources, demographic development. I believe that they are real, unlike my president in the United States. But even if they were not real, I mean, this is how we experience the future. Secondly, the past is no longer something we, we believe we can work through and leave behind us. I think largely due, not exclusively due to electronic storage possibilities, the past, pastness as I like to call it, is something that aggressively invades the present. Yeah? I mean, to give you one example, if you know, until 200 years ago, the year was symbolically structured by saints, every day had several saints in the church year. Now there is no day that is not multiply memorial day. Yeah? I mean, Every day is being celebrated as the memory of something. Nobody can really write a dissertation in history anymore uh, in which the um, rule would be that you take into account all accessible documents. Nobody today in the electronic age can really take into account by writing a dissertation all accessible documents, completely impossible, and so forth and so forth. Now, between that congested future and this aggressive pastness, thirdly, and this is where I want to go, uh, our present is no longer an imperceptibly short moment of transition. I think our everyday present today, and I'm inviting you to see whether these are feelings or impressions you share with me, I'm trying to describe what's going on in my everyday. Our present is an ever broadening present of simultaneities. Everything is in the present, and we have a hard time structuring it. Present. And I want to come to that present, so an ever-broadening present 
of Simon Gillette. He's no longer an imperceptible short moment of religion. Finally, uh, if this present of the historical worldview, the present of tradition, was related to a human self-reference that was Cartesian, only consciousness, and if our present is a broadening present, a different present, has a different structure, that might perhaps explain why today, both in our everyday and intellectually, we are so desperately trying to recuperate the soma, to recuperate sensibility, to recuperate the body, to recuperate presence, to recuperate shimon. Yeah? I mean, both in our early morning jogging that I replaced by early morning cigarette, but that's also a physical pleasure, and in disciplines like uh, neural philosophy. Yeah? I don't believe in them. I mean, I don't think they have a great future, but maybe they have. Or at Aarhus, there's a chair now for, what is it called? Robotics philosophy or something like that. Yeah? I mean, no, I, mean, I take that seriously, but I also think it's symptomatic. It's that much fun. Yeah? So, I think this is our present. Now, let's go one step further, and that's in preparation, so I'll need another 10 minutes, so at least time for two questions. Um, so, the condition would be we are living in the broadening present, no longer in the historical worldview. What consequences does that have? The historical world, in a way, had eliminated aesthetic experience in the sense that aesthetic experience had its autonomy. It was the other, so to speak. Yeah? It was the quasi-religious autonomy and otherness of the world. Now, let's focus for a moment uh, on this problem present. I will try to describe um, our present cultural situation in Denmark, in California, uh, in Australia, etc., etc. Maybe not in Amazonia, maybe not in Madagascar. Talking about global. Um, my formula would be that if, under conditions of the historical worldview, the world appeared as a field of contingency, so things appeared polyperspectival, but it would always transform them into necessity. Yeah. Field of contingency. So the world is polyperspectival, the world is contingent. I'm saying that in German because contingent is not exactly synonymous with contingent. The world is contingent, but always couched by things that are considered to be necessary and things that are considered to be impossible, things that we can imagine without being able to have human humans. I believe in this broad present, our world is transitioning from a field of contingency to a universe of contingency. So things that formerly could be considered necessary or fake uh, are now up to choice. Things that formerly were considered to be impossible now are possibilities. So give you two examples. Traditionally, in the historical worldview, the sex, and I'm saying sex deliberately, not gender, into which you were born, was considered to be fake. Yeah? As much as you wanted to be a woman, if you were born with many genitals, tough luck, you were a man. Uh, today, I mean, it turns out that the best friend of my eight-year-old granddaughter, Clara, is Sabine. And Sabine has many genitals. And since her, I mean, since her parents found out in her third, fourth year that she desperately wanted to be a woman, so they have been going to a program at the University of Munich, uh, psychological, psychiatric, I mean, not psychiatric in the sense of disease, preparing uh, uh, transsexual surgery. Everybody in this Bavaria, you know, Bavaria being the most conservative part of Germany, part of Germany in the village where she's living, knows that. Everybody's rooting for it. The village priest in the high mass on Sunday was praying for her. I mean, this is a better world than you used to have. You got my point. This is, I mean, something that used to be necessary and faith is now choice. On the other hand, to give you one example, a typically possibility of the olden times was eternal life. We could imagine eternal life, but we could not attribute eternal life to humans. <laughs> Today, whether it will ever come is another question, but eternal life, eternity, is now a research claim for medical schools. And this is medicine, where medicine is going. Is eternal life possible? And that would I mean not we are condemned to live eternity, but we can choose. Okay, 
I'm now 70, I'd rather want to live another 50 years to get some replacements and so forth and so forth. Yeah? Get the point. So that's what I mean by transformation of field of contingents into universal contingents. Is that clear? Now, uh, this transformation implies a huge growth of liberty, of freedom. I mean, the story about the Bavarian village and Sabine, I mean, breaks tears from us. It's beautiful, beautiful. But I think that at the same time, it might be not only for non-intellectuals, but for us too, too much complexity. Yeah. I mean, to live in a universe of contingency where everything is up to choice and to grips at every given moment may be too much. I mean, I oftentimes think it's too much. Um, so that there is ambiguity in our cultural situation. On the one hand, we live in a universe of contingency, and that is the kind of high point of the Cartesian working. Yeah, I mean, everything is up to choice. I mean, you can control the body completely. I mean, sex into which you're born doesn't play anymore, eternal life, etc., etc. And at the same time, I think, this situation, that's the ambiguity, explains an existential desire to hold on to something, an existential desire for certainties. And I think this existential desire to hold on to something explains the multiple populisms all over the world today. I mean, we have a particularly tough situation in the U.S. Um, that there's so many people with that problem that Trump got president. But I mean, I was just reading. I mean, as you're talking about Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung yesterday, the IFD in Germany, which is a fundamentalist party, is on its way to become the second strongest party. The last week, the SPD lost three percent, and they gained three percent. I mean, I'm not predicting anything, but I get my point. This desire to hold on to something seems to be something uh, threatening our situation. Okay, final stretch, five minutes. What does that mean for the situation of aesthetics today? Um, so I think the environment that I want to characterize is an environment between this universe of contingents, everything is possible on the one hand, and this very gutsy, this very elementary uh, desire of certainty, it's not intellectual certainty, it's existential certainty, it's something to hold on to, having your place, for example. Yeah, I think this, this, this coming back of, of, of homeland, of Heimat, of small regions that you want to live in, that you're familiar with, is part of that. <laughs> Secondly, uh, I find it interesting that in the early 19th century, 20th century, think of the Avangards, there was this program, these manifestos that wanted to bring aesthetic experience back into life. Yeah? I mean, this mediation, I mean, think of somebody uh, like Breton, but also think of Marinetti. It was not politically specific, but I think of the art programs in the early Soviet Union, it never happened. I think today we could say that tendentially a steady experience in the Baumgart sense. Yeah. So this is a relation to the world that is not only conceptual, not only experience, but always includes sensitivity, has become only present. Has become only present in the sense that we may say everything is a steady experience today. Um, for example, in 89, when I arrived at Stanford, I got invited, I don't know why, uh, by a very, very wealthy and visible colleague, the chemist called Jarassi, who had invented the birth control pill and cortisone. And he got married for the third time, and so a beautiful invitation. I went there. And the catering company was called Edible Art. <laughs> In 89, I thought this was completely crazy. I mean, doesn't this go a little bit too far? Is this not too deep? Today, I think edible arts, I mean, think of Copenhagen and the restaurant scene in Copenhagen, which I think, and I mean it, I'm not only saying that Denmark is the best in the world, but the number of places where edible art would not be strange is very, very high. Think of the position of fashion, for example. Think of these flowers here uh, on the podium, and I mean it, uh, I mean, I've been in the academic world, I've been happy it for a very long time. Flowers on the podium are new. And it's beautiful, I mean, it's a generation. But 
I mean, what for Baumgarten and since Baumgarten was specific, you know, the presence of sensuality, if you want the return of sensuality in our everyday, has become something quite general. And I'm not saying it's any bad, but we could, of course, ask if it's now general, if aesthetic experience omnipresent, whether it does, it does not make aesthetic experience collapse. Yeah, if it's omnipresent, it is no longer so specific. I mean, we haven't reached the final stage. Is that, is that consideration clear? And I think we could go on and on and on uh, with examples. Also, the fact that 300,000 people are living in Berlin may be say subsidized as Kulturschaffende, which is why I don't like Berlin. But uh, it's 300,000 out of 3.5 million. Yeah? That is quite astonishing. I mean, incomparably more proportionately than the great culture town of Berlin after 1800, and whatever they do, crap, but, but they're all, they're all Kulturschaffende. OK, so that's, that, that's easy to clear. My next point would be that in spite or with this omnipresence of aesthetic experience in the present cultural situation, uh, we still have this tension between universal contingency, too many choices, too many possibilities, everything is just opposed, and on the other hand, uh, this desire to hold on to something, yeah? this desire that I would associate with concepts like body without organ, that I would associate uh, with concepts like black hole. So my question would be whether in this context, whether autonomous or not, aesthetic intensity could not just be a kind of process where on the one hand, universe of contingency, overwhelming plurality of possibilities, overwhelming plurality of perspectives, moves into a form, moves into a form. Uh, to give you an example of a type of art, 20th century art, where I very strongly have this feeling that's Jackson Pollock from me. Yeah? I mean, that if you look, if you kind of look into the eye of a Pollock picture, but if you dare to engage with the whirlpool of a Pollock picture, you have this experience, you have this, I have this feeling. So there's an infinite plurality of things that is still sensible, that is still somehow there, but at the same time, uh, those paintings have a form. But you could also imagine the other movement. So this would be out of universe of contingents into an individual form, yeah? into something like Paul of I mean, my favorite Paul of painting. And on the other hand, that would also move on a movement of intensity. You would have something like a body without organ, an unarticulated body, which within aesthetic experience, within the process of intensity, becomes articulated. That would be, for me, my favorite side of aesthetic experience in sports. Yeah? I mean, if you have the two teams, for example, of a women's handball game, I think this is the most, the best national sport in Denmark, is that correct? <laughs> I wanted to show that I know something about sports. <laughs> but I mean, Denmark recently played really Germany well. They should have won in this memorial game in Copenhagen, but they're telling Germany, so they've won one. Anyway, you could say when the teams come into the stadium, they have no form. Yeah? I mean, there are 11 bodies that are juxtaposed. And the moment that the game begins, and any sport begins, doesn't have to be a team final, doesn't have to be a team sport, uh, all of a sudden you have a form. So something that was not articulated, something that was this holding on to part, yeah? sheer body, comes into a form. So my dream in a way, or my hope would be that aesthetic experience via intensity, omnipresent or not, in this present cultural situation between universe of contingency on the one side, too much complexity on the one side, and this 
dangerous, threatening desire to hold on to something on the other side could activate us not to have a middle level in the Aristotelian sense, but to have this in stable moments of form. In stable moments of form, in stable moments of form that are never permanent. Yeah? So this is not the form of sculpture, but this is the form of your relationship. This is not the form as a computer or robot could identify a protection hollow pain, but the, the moment in which you feel this is uh, in finite complexity cast into a form. I think there is no way, I mean, if we think about ourselves, the art historians, the museum people, people who teach literature as teachers, uh, that we can teach that and that we can guarantee our students that this will happen, these processes of intensity uh, in our time. And by the way, I thought the 10 minutes that you engaged with this gates was such a moment. It was absolutely fabulous and it was beautifully unstable because when you stopped, it was gone. And I felt, no, no, I mean, I think this cannot, this is not like, it's, like the materiality of sculpture. It is a moment when it happens, a moment when we are neither depressed by overwhelming complexity nor tempted by this holding on to something very elementary. So I think uh, this would be not my diagnostic, but that's my impression and my tentative and experimental impression. What aesthetic experience on a historical background, against a historical background, including presence, could be today. I mean, we have three minutes time. I thank you for your patience and the passion and the tragedy of your faces, which made it possible to say this all in one hour. Thank you. <laughs>
because it's everybody's thing, I mean, we are all included, gets completely transformed into this gesture of holding on to. That's what these Twitter do, because there are millions and millions of people that I think not only in the US, but oh, here's somebody who is strong. Yeah, who is somebody who can simplify the world. Whereas, I'm deeply convinced, I've been mean, talking as an American citizen, that Obama will go down in history as a greater president than we think now, uh, not so much because it was African American, it was terrific, but because there wasn't a state of politics. Yeah? I mean, Obama was a terrific speaker, but also, for example, the transition of the White House between the Obama family to the Trump family, to not do that in a sloppy way, or not be present, but to know that form is important, and to preserve form at the White House till the last moment, yeah? And with the Trumps moving, it was over. You get my point? So, so I mean, while I, of course, one can't help the mind, as I say, uh, I think we are in a different situation. Uh, Benjamin was also not in a situation of this, what I try to describe on the president that experience. So, I disagree. I, I don't disagree with him. I mean, I disagree with him if I take it as a prescription for today. But I think I don't disagree with him because our situations are so different. Just as a footnote, and I have to admit, although I'm from not too far from where Adorno was born, uh, I've never liked Adorno, but his insistence of form, for example, in this absolutely amazing essay on Hölderlin, yeah, uh, Paul Taxi, the insistence of form, that would go a long way in my sense, in the sense of intensity. Yeah? I mean, transforming universe of contingents into a form, and into a form that never lasts. So it's not the form that you find on the paper as verses, but this form of prosody that you feel when somebody is reciting the prosody. So all of a sudden, I never thought about it. Uh, like under these premises that I'm trying to describe for the present, uh, I don't know if it's more than I ever thought. <laughs> I mean, he would be offended to hear that from me, but he's dead, so he doesn't. <laughs> One more question? Please, one more, then I can go to the bathroom and think it was successful. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Francis as well, but didn't coordinate that. Um, and thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, I was just thinking about your description about the historical times and now the transition into something else. Uh, I'm not sure if you already coined that, I have a term or headline or title for that situation. Do you? Present situation. Yeah, exactly. And, and both um, the transition, the, the, the going from a, a historical way of thinking about the world and then to a situation now where the conditions of presence are different. Do you have a. Um, yeah, no, I call it, I mean, I call it, uh, I call it all broad present. And I mean, it is. Uh, uh, it's always very embarrassing to, to refer to writings of one or even have a little book under that title, uh, Columbia University. So this description of a different temporality, right? I mean, like like the future occupied by threats that come uh, towards us and this kind of aggressive past that's invading the present, broadening the present, everything's in the present. That I have described and I think I'm able to describe that. Whereas the question, so what does this mean for aesthetics? That was the experiment of the day. But, uh, so what's the question you had about the temporal description, temporal description? Well, both. I shouldn't I answer that to you by my book, but. I'm not sure I haven't read that, but uh, I, I just thought it was extremely interesting to try and pick one, but describe perhaps a little bit more thoroughly um, what, what made us go from, from one to, to the other. Yeah. Um, the transition from that historical epoch, and sort of how that yeah. No, no, yeah. Uh, I mean, the answer would be mercifully short, not because the question is not interesting, but I think, so as you saw in that talk, I've been trying over the past 10 years to describe such chronotropes, such historical constructions of temporality. And they're clearly historical and they're clearly cultural. You know, I've never done a non Western one, but I know a little bit about classical Japanese culture, and it's definitely all this. Different from anything temporality wise I've ever seen in Western culture. Um, I, I refrain from trying to explain why they fade and why new temporalities are emerging. 
Uh, one reason is philosophically qualified, because trying to ask them to explain it philosophically would be Hegelian. And of course, it was an implication of what I was saying that the Hegelian way of thinking is specific to the historical worldview. So if you are out of the historical worldview, that is not an appropriate way of thinking. But I would also say that's the second answer, because my experience is kind of devastating for my self in which whatever I come up with uh, as explanations is so banal that I'm embarrassed. Yeah? I mean, growing world complexity, for example, you can always say that. Yeah? So I don't know. Certainly, let's also have banal, but I do think uh, there is a certain possibility there is a relationship uh, to electronic technology. I'm not saying exclusively, yeah? but for example, uh, what I was describing as this melting away of the poles of what is necessary, faith, and what is impossible, I mean, this has to do with the computation potency and power of those machines, without any doubt. Or, for example, the relationship to the past, and the past, this is not a thought through past, that's just materials from the past, that they are so present, that we always already have too much of it, that has to do with the storage power of electronic technology. So this is not my all-over joker answer. It's everything depends on electronic technology. But I do think uh, that in the emergence uh, of this broad present, that certainly began much earlier than electronic technology. It plays a very strong reinforcing role. That would be my guess. Now, the first pretty short answer got very long. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. OK, thank you. Um, there were a few more questions. We don't have time for more, but uh, there is a panel of debate tomorrow, and there'll be possibility to to ask more questions tomorrow. Um, for now, thank you to Seth for a wonderful talk and very inspiring. Thank you. Special requirements for food, please uh, write it on paper up here before you go out. Thank you.